Ah. Okay, that's clever. Brilliant. Yeah, so so welcome everybody to our third Policy Influencers Network group, um, curated by, by us, the Urban Agriculture Consortium. Uh, the theme that we're going to be exploring today is about the connections between soil health and population health and how they come together in, in, uh, in good nutrition, in the nutrient density and quality of our food. Um, we're really pleased to welcome um, Anna Cura from um, the Food Farming and Countryside Commission, um, Elizabeth Westaway from Growing Real Food for Nutrition, um, Gavin Fletcher from Leicestershire County Council Public Health, and also later on, we'll have um, Kathy and John from Nottinghamshire County Council, who will also be sharing something of their experience in, um, in looking at food from a public health perspective. Um, so we'll be um, having a, hearing from Anna and Elizabeth and having a breakout session with a couple of question prompts. Um, then we'll have a short break, then hear from the, from the county councils, and then we'll be doing a kind of, uh, we'll be having a go at like crowd writing some policy stuff, our dream policy stuff, uh, based on everything that we will have heard and what's, what that has inspired. And then that will be a resource for us to share around everybody that will hopefully be useful in a, in a practical way and in the conversations that you're going to have with your colleagues going forward. Um, so um, I'll just pass to, to Jeremy just to uh, briefly introduce the, the pings um, and the context for the bigger, wider context for today. Um, to you, Jeremy. Hey, thanks, Maddie. Thanks, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see some uh, familiar and new names in this group. Um, the ping idea is something we came up with after consultation with people in the, in the UAC network. And the idea was to create a forum for people from local authorities and people in the NGO side of things, food partnerships, to have a collaborative discussion and try and share good practice and good ideas. And that's the spirit of this meeting is everyone is respectful and listens to each other's ideas and hopefully we'll get some good interaction and some good um, dialogue going in the, in the breakout sessions and as Maddie said later on in the in the explore, experimental policy writing forum which we're quite excited about um, this is the third ping that we've held that was a UK wide level but we'd also like to thank our colleagues in Northern Ireland who ran four now uh, pilot pings over the last year um, and that's helped us learn how to run these things but also it's given us the notion that the ping concept doesn't belong to UAC that anybody can take this this format format and we're happy to advise how we've done it but use it for their own ends and we're thinking there might be a separate policy influence network group for example in the Midlands and as, as was mentioned we've got Leicestershire Nottinghamshire County Council here and also uh, people from Northamptonshire so there's a sort of like a notion that the ping concept could be framed to different contexts and that might even apply for example to us working in Greater Manchester with the Greater Manchester Command Authority to provide a forum to unblock some of the misunderstandings between people in Greater Manchester which are many as I can I'm sure some of you know. Um, we just thought we'd just share a couple of quotes from the IPCC report that came out on Monday um, and it, basically it just says what we probably in this set in this forum already know that to avoid mounting loss of life, biodiversity and infrastructure, ambitious accelerated action is required to adapt to climate change at the same time as uh, making rapid cuts in greenhouse grasses. And it goes on. I mean, I haven't read the whole thing. Obviously, it actually says that substantive ag agriculture, agricultural production losses are projected for most northern European areas over the 21st century. Not helped at all, of course, by a situation in Ukraine, but in the section on mitigation it talks about irrigation vegetation changes in farming practices and specifically mentions agroecology 
So I think we we should bear that in mind when we're sort of going through the not only this discussion but future discussions in this forum and others. Um, that's about all I need to say. So thanks very much, and I've, I'm really interested to hear what Anna and Elizabeth and then Gavin later on and Kathy and John have got to say. And we welcome all your contributions. Mm. Thank Fantastic. You. Just before we start, just wanting to emphasise that this. The pings are a space for you to connect with each other and for and to build relationships and build solidarity share ideas and so when we um go into the breakout rooms um have more of a chance to connect on a on a personal level and and sort of build relationships with each other um yes as, as jeremy said it's this is about adding fuel uh, to accelerate everything that we're doing um, and local authorities obviously aren't known for being the, the, the quickest movers but there is a um, we want to do whatever we can to help that acceleration to happen at a um, at a local authority county council uh, level and on, on all fronts so um, bearing all that in mind as we have our have our discussion today. And I will hand over to Anna without further ado. Thank you, Maddie, and thank you, Jeremy, um, for having me here today. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces in the group as well. So apologies if you've heard all of this before. Um, <laughs> being the first one, I have the responsibility to try and frame this conversation. Um, I'll be briefly talking a little bit about myself and where, where which organization I'm coming from and some of the research that we've done hopefully to spark conversation and and um, have, have questions for for us to explore later um, if, if that's useful. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, there we go. Can you all see this? Nope. Not that. Uh, this would be better. There we go. <laughs> That's great. There we go. Excellent. So, um, as uh, Maddie said, my name is Anna Kira. I am a senior researcher at the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. I am technically a zoologist, but I've worked in the food space for about a decade now and I'm fascinated with systemic change, with language and framing, and been bringing that um, passion, I suppose, within the space of food insecurity in the last few years. Um, just a little bit about the commission. Um, so we really we started in 2017 and became an independent uh, charity in 2020. Um, we really just um, emerging from the, the just shift in public mood um, around sort of coming together to stop climate change and ecosystem breakdown and, and simultaneously support the health and well-being of, of our communities. Um, and we're wanting to turn this growing movement for change into practical actions that actually work on the ground. So that's very much a driving force behind the Commission's work uh, and, and sort of together working towards a fairer and more sustainable food and, and farming system. And, and crucially a countryside that works for all. So food, farming and countryside being our, our key themes. Um, how, how do we deliver on that? So um, there's three different ways. Um, we uh, convene leadership and host conversation around some of the difficult issues that are relevant to food, farming and countryside. We also implement some of the recommendations of, of the reports um, that we produce and the research and the insights that we gather across the, the nation. Um, and figure out ways on how we can implement those. And we try and divert as much as we can resource it towards communities to do change on the ground. We deliver our work um, nationally. Uh, so we are, we are, we are a networked uh, organization, but we also have um, uh, six uh, inquiries. So we've got three uh, country inquiries in Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. And we also have three county inquiries in, in England in Cumbria, um, Cambridgeshire and Devon. 
Um, and we work across three main themes. So we've got my teams uh, looking at farming. So very much convening leadership around a transition to agroecology and identifying barriers and opportunities. Um, and they're looking at financing uh, that transition at the moment. I've got my colleagues within the land use team, uh, which are currently piloting a land use framework for England. Um, so again, how do we decide how we use our land for all the different things that we wanted to provide for us? And then there's myself within the food and health team, um, looking at how we talk about food, how can we ensure that a transition to agroecology actually is accessible to everyone, uh, not just those who can afford um, certain types of food and affordability is something I'll be talking about in a minute, in a minute, in a moment. And, and also within that context, how can we move away uh, from an emergency food aid uh, model that we're currently seeing a rise of with the crisis that we're facing and, and shifting that towards community food networks. So on that theme, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Hungry for Health, which is our latest research, um, which I hopefully I can do without my dog distracting me too much. So if you hear a snoring dog, uh, it's just because it's the, it's a Zoom call, <laughs> sort of mandatory thing to have <laughs> at the moment. Um, so Hungry for Health um, is some research that we've carried out in Devon um, at the end of last year. So the um, why we've done this research is because we know that there are financial barriers to healthy and sustainable um, diets, especially for people on low income. But there's this prevailing story um, that says that in order to address that, we need food to be cheaper rather than perhaps addressing some, some other root causes within that framework. And that drive for cheap food really is damaging to our, to our health. The kind of food that it promotes is not particularly healthy and is damaging for our environment um, on, on equal measure. And it's only really cheap in the short term, but, but how do we change that? How do we change narrative? And how, how does that affect the kind of solutions that might work for citizens and producers within that context? So we wanted to explore um, various dimensions of food affordability and, and what some of the potential solutions to address those by speaking directly with people actually experiencing food insecurity um, and some of the producers who are currently supplying surplus food to uh, charities that are part of um, some of the sort of more emergency or charitable food aid solutions that we see so much of today. And we really wanted to get a feel for what, what solutions extend beyond that cheap story of food and emergency food aid. Um, equally, we wanted to also see how community food projects like the Food in Community, who we partnered up with to do this work, how, how, can, they, how can they be part of that solution as well? Um, there is an emergency need right now that we need to you know, cater for, um, but within that, there's still scope to think about what we're trying to build um, going forward. And ultimately trying to understand what do we mean by affordability and uh, what, what new story can, can we tell in, uh, around that. So a quick, um, quick note on, on how we did this study. So uh, Food in Community um, is based in Totnes in Devon, which tends to be regarded as quite a sort of affluent and foodie place, but many areas within the South Hans region and where we're working actually fall within the 10% most deprived in England. So just to get a bit of perspective. Um, as an organization, they mostly collect and deliver surplus food from organic food producers in the region, but they also have pay as you feel lunches, they have cleaning activities, cooking clubs and workshops. As part of our research, we mostly focused on the uh, collecting and delivering of surplus food that they deliver through the box scheme. We did semi-structured interviews. We interviewed about 19 people uh, within that study uh, at the end of last year, and uh, we tried to speak to as, as, such, as much a variety of people as possible. So we had single moms with young families. We had people who were retired, people who lived alone, um, sort of different, different age groups, and just to get a flavor of what people were saying. Um, and what did we find? Well, the first thing that we found is that affordability goes well beyond the cost of the food item itself. So one of the questions that we asked everyone is, what makes food feel affordable to you? And the very first thing that would come out of people's mouths is quality. Now, the way that they would define quality may vary a little bit. So they might talk about quality and, and sort of nutritious food, organic or fresh, or flavorsome, local, but quality just resonated across all of those um, answers. 
Um, they talked about how the, the you know, the, the, the cost of it would fit within um, their budgets or how the food that they would buy would actually fit within their week, um, how they would stretch over um, different meals. So there was an example of someone saying that they'd rather spend a little bit more on bread because they knew that one slice of that bread would feel very nutritious and that the bread itself would last for the whole week as opposed to buying something really cheap that wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be satiating and I would go moldy within a day or two. Um, they talked also about um, their priorities, their, their needs, their preferences for themselves or the family, whether it was personal preferences or having to cater for different health conditions as well. That, that, that sort of shifted how they would prioritize how they would spend their budget. Variety of food was also quite a key thing that they, they praised and they wanted to access as much as possible and very much valued from the, the vegetable and, and fruit boxes that they were getting. And ultimately it was that it was what made food feel affordable was what, what they could actually purchase and what they actually valued and what they could prioritize to fit within a particular budget. We spoke to producers as well and what was interesting is that they were more likely to focus on the cost dimension of affordability and it just does make me wonder whether when we do not experience household food insecurity ourselves we're privileged enough to be in that position we tend to uh, frame things in a slightly different way and, and might have a tendency to put that cost dimension more um but producer also cared very much about quality and really felt the tension between quality and price um, labor and fuel costs being quite quite big barriers um, for small businesses, particularly if they wanted to do good farming. <laughs> um, in terms of solutions uh, that we explored with them, uh, we asked you know, if they were to imagine a completely different world, what, what would they want to see? It was very much sort of focused on community and connection. So whilst the finances were a given as part of the conversation, it wasn't really the focus of most answers. What they wanted to see was a diversity of food projects and businesses within the community. They wanted to find ways to share resources and have like collective food buying and preparation activities. Um, they wanted more reciprocal arrangements so that it's not just about a financial transaction to obtain food, but there might be an exchange of skills. And they wanted to actually see more investment and, and priority given to smaller and more sustainable food production. These, these were the kinds of things that they valued. And they really echoed what we heard um, from the producer side as well, who wanted more community owned businesses, who wanted to really be embedded within the community and, and, and hire within the community and help revive the local economy, um, who really wanted a, a more decentralized food production system um, and, and a high diversity of, of food production distribution points within the community. I mean, a lot of them talked about having processing um, uh, units uh, locally, whether that's um, mills or, or abattoirs. So what does that mean? <laughs> so um, there's clearly a, a shift in narrative that needs to happen with it when we talk about making food affordable. And that might shift some of the priorities in terms of what kind of activities we might want to support. And the term of affordability can really trigger that cost or sort of economic framing people's minds, but it's so much more than that. It's a very multidimensional con uh, concept that really connects with people's relationship with food, how it fits into their everyday lives, what foods they value as part of their diet, and it will vary from person to person and context to context. But what did come quite clearly is that a single dimension of affordability as cheapness really is off the mark. Um, and it also adds to the fact that simply examining purchasing behavior in order to assess what people really value really oversimplifies what people actually want. Um, and it also excludes those who cannot afford what they value. So it led to sort of two conclusions um, in our research. The first is a need to build and use that different narrative around food affordability, and one that is really centered around good quality food. And I'm sure Elizabeth would have a lot to say about what that is. Um, and also focus on improved financial situations for people. So that could mean rebalancing cost of food to make um, healthy food more affordable than unhealthy ultra processed food. Um, it could mean sort of increase and sort of promote um, the production and distribution of high quality food. Um, or it could mean just supporting um, sort of financial circumstances for citizens with higher, more stable wages and, and benefit systems. Which leads on to the second point, which is around investing, investing in community food systems that really support a diversity of means of accessing that high quality food. 
Um, it might also include ways which sit outside the traditional financial food market, but but, but not just that. I mean, how could we invest in, in land for community growing, for community kitchens? Can we invest in, in relationships between producers and local communities and organizations? Is there a way to, to diversify and multiply small or uh, community level food businesses? You know, what can we do to, to encourage entrepreneurship spirit um, within a local area? Uh, there are many ways in which that can be, that, that could be done. Um, specifically, what does that mean for local authorities? And I don't have the answer to that because every local authority will have a different context. Um, so this is where I'm kind of turning to the audience here. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so I've got a series of questions that perhaps we can begin to think about as we listen to what Elizabeth has to say and when we exchange where we're at within various uh, local authorities. So the first, the first question I always ask is how do we approach issues around food and health and what, what language are we actually using within our day-to-day -day work? Um, how much focus is given to tackling the problem, whether that's um, unhealthy food, um, household food insecurity, or sort of climate issues? Um, and how much are we giving focus to what we're trying to build, the sort of a community where people can thrive, an environment that is good for people, animals, and planet? Um, and then how are we providing a service to communities as a local authority or with communities? How are we engaging with our communities? How participatory is the process? Because clearly the way that they experience um, their lives within the community can differ slightly to what our assumptions might be. Um, secondly, how, how do we invest as a local authority in the infrastructure is actually needed to support a community that thrives and a community food system, for example? And infrastructure can mean so many things, and I wish I had another hour to talk about that, but is it social infrastructure? So training, mentoring, knowledge sharing, networking, movement building, or is it a physical infrastructure? So for people to do all of that, they need to meet somewhere physically or digitally for some people, but it can be exclusive, exclusive for others. So that could be buildings, land, community centers, um, you know, site developments. Um, there's a whole range of things that fit within that category. Is it a political infrastructure? Um, how, how much can we support people to, to self-organize? Um, how can we encourage citizen advocacy? Um, or equally, what about the regulations that are already in place or the levers that we can use or that we might come up with in today's session? Um, and actually procurement comes a lot in mind as well as, a, as an often a mechanism um, to, to use to encourage that local infrastructure. Um, culturally as well, how much do we celebrate food? How, how much do we celebrate diversity of food and, and ethnicities and, and, and cuisines that might be part of our of all the different communities that, 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 that are part of our region. And what about financial infrastructure, whether that's stable income for citizens or capital investment for say, local horticultural production. And then one thing that I like to think about when, when we try to explore opportunities within that space is what is currently working what, what are we hopeful about um, you know, within our sphere of influence? What are our concerns within that space? And what do you think is, is missing in order for us to be able to really support the communities that we serve? So I will be thinking about these questions as I listen to our conversations over the next um, couple of hours. Um, I'm running out of time and there's so much more that I wish I could share with you. I just wanted to flag a couple of other pieces of work that we've done. Um, one is um, a report called Food Bu Builds Community, uh, which is almost self-explanatory, but really showing how you know, food is, is not just a nutritional um, item. It, is, it can be such a strong social tool. So even when we are faced with an emergency need and having to sort of distribute food to people, is there another way that we can think about using that platform to really start building that social infrastructure I was talking about? So there's a lot on that report there. And the other one is around sort of policy interventions and suggestions. Uh, we have a report called Shifting the System, which really shows that once we have an idea that we think we sort of support the transition that we wanna see, the way that we talk about that policy, um, how we frame it, how we present it, the order in which we present things is really important. It can really shift the way that people either support this policy or not. And I think that might interest quite a few of you as well. Um, all of that and all of our work is on the Healthy Food Hub online, so you're more than welcome to go and see. Um, but yeah, that's that's it for me for now. Um, if you've got any questions, obviously let me know now, or you can email me later as well. Thank you.
absolutely brilliant and thank you so much there's a lot of uh surprising things in that research as well and really challenging things and um a lot also to hold on to to take a lead from um yeah it really gives a really good clear set of the th kind of things that we need to local authorities need to be thinking about in the direction to head in i wonder whether um you might be able to put some of those questions um, just into the chat or into a blank doc in the chat, maybe so that um, people can have those to hand as well. Just, just what was on your slide, it was really brilliant. Let me do that now. Marvellous. Does anyone have any, any questions for Anna um, before we move on to Elizabeth? maybe having to absorb all of that <laughs> there was quite a lot of my apologies <laughs> no it's fantastic lots to think about um great oh holly did you sorry i just i yeah um i was trying to find the hand button i gave <laughs> up um <laughs> uh yeah um thanks Anna. how typical do you think the people you surveyed were um because a lot of what you came back with is really surprising and it was really interesting the sort of the different approach you know the, the people's priorities and the how different that is to the way that food poverty is often assumed and i wondered yeah whether you felt that this was a typical group it's a very fair question we get that a lot um ideally we would want to replicate or at least sort of sound sound like this with other regions um so I would say, I would confidently say that it's fairly representative in a sense that I've done a lot of work around language and framing and depending on how you ask questions, people can respond very differently. So if you ask the consumer what they care about, cost will be the first thing. If you ask a citizen what they care most about is around fairness, is about environment, is around health. Um, and, you know, I say this as a consumer slash citizen myself, <laughs> um, this is this is psychology. So um, I think that plays a little bit into that. I do think that the people, the group that we specifically looked at, I mean, they are surrounded with a, a food environment that um, in Devon that is um, quite specific to Devon. So they're very close to the land. They're very exposed to uh, quite a range of of producers and a certain type of farming um i think riverford is based there so you know they're quite exposed to that narrative already so if we were to ask you know it's in a city um communities i don't know in, in birmingham we might have a very different story um i would hope though that the values remain the same and i think that's what i also want to to put across here is that how we ask the questions is important and assuming that people don't care is a dangerous path to take <laughs> so that, that's what i would say I hope, I hope i haven't digressed too much no that's really that's i think that's answered it well thanks marvelous thank you um thanks vicky just put a, a link in the chat as well says we found some similar themes in our food access work over the years. Thank you, thanks for that Vicky. So we'll move on to Elizabeth and I'm gonna have a go at playing your, um, Elizabeth's got a slightly dodgy internet connection or an unreliable um, uh, temperamental internet connection. So I'm going to try She's recorded her talk and I'm going to do my best to um, play it for you. Can everybody see that screen share? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I would like to thank Jeremy and Maddie for giving me the opportunity of presenting to you today on nutrient-dense food, a regenerative solution for human and planetary health. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Westaway. I'm an international public health nutrition specialist, permaculturalist, co-founder and director of Growing Real Food for Nutrition CIC, which is an award-winning social enterprise learning how to grow, measure and promote the benefits of nutrient-dense food. Griffin's vision for the future involves a paradigm shift from our current worldview based on control in which profiteering large multinational corporations are using industrial agriculture practices to poison our planet, food and people. We want instead a worldview based on cooperation where an abundance of high quality nutrient dense food and optimal health and well-being prevails. We are what we eat or think. So to get to the vision on the right, things need to change. The problem is that the current standard for food quality is based on profit, and this has resulted in industrial agriculture, GM and hydroponic crops proliferating to maximise profit. But at what cost? Environmental justice has been sidelined with worsening planetary health and the global emergencies of biodiversity loss, poor soil health and climate change have resulted. Similarly, social justice has not been prioritised, leading to inequalities and deteriorating human health, with the global emergencies of malnutrition in all its forms, increasing degenerative diseases, including diet-related non-communicable diseases, um, such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease and some cancers, as well as the proliferation of viruses such as COVID-19. There has been a 40% loss of key minerals in the UK food supply chain from 1939 to 1991. And globally, there has been no attempt to define the quality of food we eat to ensure that it is packed full of beneficial nutrients. In terms of food quality standards, the UK ostensibly ignores it. Um, certified standards such as the Red Tractor focuses on food safety and hygiene, minimising use of plant protection products, um, these are pesticides, insecticides and fungicides, and minimising any adverse impact the farm has on wildlife, flora, fauna and the environment. Now, in Europe, there's a confused picture, and the EU in 2018 state that the notion of food quality rests on a complex and multidimensional concept, which is influenced by a wide range of situational and conventional factors. In the United Nations, they are getting there. So the FAO um, in 2004 states food, um, so quality rests on expected properties such as organoleptic and nutritional characteristics or resulting benefits. And for organically certified produce, multiple studies fail to convince. So in the UK, the Food Standards Agency and the Advertising Standards Authority will not accept claims for the nutritional superiority of organically certified foods. Not all food is equal, so our food choices can make a difference to people and planet. Hence, it is important to be aware of and ideally follow the principles of a healthy, balanced, diverse and sustainable diet. So we eat less meat and more plants, um, eat a higher proportion of plant-based foods relative to animal source foods, ensuring that animal source foods are of the highest nutritional quality, ensure balance and variety, as too much of any one food won't be good for you or the planet, and eat different food groups and different foods within these groups. Avoid processed foods. So look for fresh ingredients where possible and choose nutrient dense foods. So get to know where your food comes from, how the agricultural workers were treated, learn how your food was grown, ideally using regenerative and agroecological practices, and consider local and seasonal foods. Now, if the guidance is to eat uh, more plants as a food group, fruits and vegetables have many benefits. They are considered rich sources of essential nutrients, such as vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients, including antioxidants and polyphenols, but only if they're nutrient dense. Uh, different coloured fruits and vegetables contain different phytonutrients, and phytonutrients can protect tissues and cells from inflammation 
by helping to regulate immune function to prevent the risk of developing chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes. There is a growing body of research showing how fruit and vegetable consumption can impact type 2 diabetes. And a study by Zheng et al, published in the BMJ in 2020, included over 23,000 people, reported that diets high in fruit and vegetables may help to reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 50%. The study concluded that consumption of even a moderately increased amount of fruit and vegetables could help to prevent the condition. Now, I just want to flag up a, re um, a really important study, a randomized control study, um, randomized controlled trial by Thoreau Patel, published in Nutrients in 2021. And they showed that daily consumption of 500 grams of traditional varieties, of strong and bitter tasting root vegetables and brassicas with a high phytonutrient content, when eaten by type 2 diabetics over a 12 week period, had significant health improvements. And this was compared with type 2 diabetics consuming modern sweet tasting varieties of the same vegetables and with those um, eating the habitual Nordic diet. Therefore, the food we eat needs to be as nutrient dense as possible with high levels of phytonutrients. So how can we measure food quality based on nutrient density? Well, at the moment, there are a couple of tools available. Uh, the science of refractometry has developed the BRICS refractometer, which measures total dissolved solids in a liquid, such as the products of photosynthesis in plant sap. And the science of spectroscopy has been used by the Bionutrient Food Association in the USA to develop an affordable handheld scanner, the Bionutrient meter, that can scan crop uh, nutrients in real time. So are all fruit and vegetables nutrient dense? Well, the Bionutrient Food Association has been researching crop nutrient variation since 2018. And they have started out by asking the question, is a carrot a carrot or do they vary? Hundreds of samples of plants were analysed with 13 different elements, including cal calcium, potassium, iron, copper and zinc, as well as antioxidants and polyphenols, which are two well-defined plant secondary metabolites associated with flavour and nutritional value. So as, um, as you can see here on the slide, in relation to mineral elements in spinach, iron varied by 14 to 1, so that one spinach leaf with the highest level has as much iron as 14 spinach leaves with the lowest level. And similarly in carrots, potassium varied by 15 to 1. So note that most of the values cluster at the lower levels. And when it came to the higher order nutritional compounds, such as antioxidants and polyphenols, in carrots, the ratio was 90 to 1 for antioxidants and 200 to 1 for polyphenols. Again, note that most of the values cluster at the lower levels. So the results show that a carrot is definitely not a carrot and there is significant nutrient variation. In 2019, the Bionutrient Food Association um, added more crops uh, along with soil samples and they collected data on crop management and environmental conditions, including soil biological activity. After reviewing over 3,000 samples of crops and the soils in which they were grown in, it was clear that no one factor, such as type of seed, no-till or fertility product, correlates with nutrient density variation. It seems to be a combination of these factors. Now, they found that the highest levels of antioxidants and polyphenols were in crops grown using regenerative practices, such as very low or no-till and continuous cover crops. And the illustration on the right shows that one would have to eat eight blueberries or three carrots to eat for one that was grown in an optimal growing condition that favours nutrient density. Observed variation in crop nutrient density did not correlate with local, organic or any other labelling or marketing type. Hence, Dan Kittredge, the BFA founder and CEO, considers that such labels are process standards, not food quality standards. So there's definitely a need for a food quality standard based on nutrient density. 
The BFA has also identified a relationship between soil carbon and nutrient density. These graphs show a strong correlation between an increase in microbial activity and soil carbon with an increase in beneficial nutrients such as antioxidants and polyphenols. So simply put, growing more nutrient-dense food can sequester more carbon. Other benefits of growing more nutrient-dense food include increased biodiversity, improved soil structure with greater water holding capacity, and reduced risk of flooding, and no soil or water pollution, and high quality nutritious food for better population health. So it's a win-win-win approach. Interest in um, connections between plant health, food and human health, as well as soil health and agriculture practices is increasing. In 2020, the Rodale Institute in the USA published their report, The Power of the Plate, the case for regenerative organic agriculture in improving human health. The report highlights a prevention-based approach to human and environmental health through an organic whole foods plant forward diet that begins on farms that work in harmony with nature and calls for better connections between agricultural systems and healthcare systems. The report concludes that the link between soil health and human health is largely unexplored and must be advanced. Um, in 2021, the Croatan Institute in the USA published their report, The Regenerative Agriculture and Human Health Nexus, Insights from Field to Body. The report defines regenerative agriculture as agriculture practices that seek to improve the nutritional value of food. It offers a framework for categorizing and better understanding different levels of nutritional interventions, from the most basic level of replacing unhealthy foods with healthy foods, all the way to considering nutrient density and interventions that support human microbiomes. The report reflects that growing more nutritious food does influence human health and calls for a new vocabulary because how we talk about nutrition and nutrients does not yet adequately capture the complexity and dynamism of food. We may never completely understand exactly how nutrient density influences human health, but we know enough to act. And for Charles Massey, this notion of food as medicine is clear. If people ate truly nutrient-rich food out of healthy soil, you would slash the National Health Bill straight away. Griffin has a number of key advocacy messages. We want to shift the narrative from food quantity based on yield to food quality based on nutrient density. We want to shift the narrative from food poverty and food security to nutrition security to acknowledge the different factors at multiple levels that impact nutrition, health and well-being. We want um, to underscore the right to nutritious food, to use food as medicine to reverse and prevent diet-related and preventable diseases, and prioritise a healthy microbiome as the foundation of human and planetary health. So, the solution is a food quality standard based on health, where regenerative agroecological practices supporting environmental justice improve planetary health, leading to greater biodiversity, restored soil health and reversal of climate change. Also, the production of nutrient-dense food, which cooperates with nature, supports social justice, with more people eating high-quality food, which results in better human health with increased consciousness, more symbiosis and total health. And that includes physical, emotional and mental health. So through cooperation and eating nutrient dense food, we could actually um, get ourselves out of this mess, the current climate crisis um, emergency. So in summary, nutrient dense food can be a regenerative solution for human and planetary health. It is important to use a nutrition lens for decision making through food systems, to bring nutrition to the centre of all food work, to improve nutrition because the multiplier effects act across all of the sustainable development goals, and to promote short, fresh, local, seasonal, high quality nutrient dense food supply chains, 
and to prioritise nutrient-dense food in public health planning, programmes and policies. However, to make this happen, there is a need for investment in future social and in economic wellbeing. So thank you very much. Um, here are some contact um, details about Griffin if you want to find out more about our work. So thank you. Absolutely brilliant, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. It's really, really fantastic. Um, very valuable, and very thought provoking. Um, I feel like I need to just let that digest for a moment. Um, does anybody have any questions immediately for Elizabeth before we go into some breakout rooms? Felicity's put something in the chat there, Elizabeth. Yeah, I was just reading that. I think definitely, Felicity, if we can arrange to have um, a call, that'd be fabulous. Sounds great, yeah. Um, we also have, a, we've got a new machine called a PXRF, which can measure all, um, all um, elements that are heavier than sodium. Um, in the periodic table, so you can get sort of the micronutrient levels within some of the plots. So um, it's, a, it's like a point and press device, so it works quite well. Yeah, I mean that that uh, machine that's that was used by the the Binutrient Food Association in America to get some of their values as well. So that's that's really good news to know that you've got it. Um, Oh, so yeah, Abbey Home Farm are interested as well. I mean, just to say there's, um, just in the last two days, well, yesterday and today, there's been a couple of peer reviewed articles um, in circulation that are absolutely fabulous and sort of shifting forward this whole area of the linkages between soil health um, and um, you know, food quality. Um, one came out, well, it was, I don't know precisely when it was published, but it was certainly circulated on social media yesterday by David Montgomery. And it's entitled um, Soil Health and Nutrient Density and looking at different um, approaches to crop production and how that um, affects food quality. And today there's um, a study has been circulated on the effects of tillage, showing that um, basically reduces key nutrients um, in the soil and it could be an explanatory factor for why so many degenerative diseases are resulting. They, they sort of cite Parkinson's and they're also saying that the study showed that stopping tillage actually um, increases yields. So there's a massive economic um, reason there for changing the, the practice. You know, in addition to the health benefits. Amazing. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'm just um, preparing um, some breakout rooms and I've put- Just noticing Joy has, has put a question there. Okay, yeah, go for it. Um, I suppose like the, the BRICS refractometer, it's, it's quite a, a simple um, device to use um, to get um, a measurement of nutrient density of your crops. Um, also, I mean, taste is a good indicator as well, because the science is saying that the greater the nutrient density, the better the taste. Um, I suppose one of the, the issues with that is if we if we're all so used to poor quality food in a way you know our, our, our taste buds probably no longer can recognize high quality nutrient dense food mm. 
yeah, I will do, Connor. I'll, I'll share these articles. And I've got quite a few more that are, um, you know, linking um, these two areas of soil health to human health. Great. Thanks, everybody. I'm just going to, um, I've put a couple of questions into the, um, into the chat and um, there'll be about, there'll be three or four people um, per room. Um, so quite small groups to hopefully get really stuck into some, some chat. Um, I'd like to invite you to work in rounds. So begin somewhere and make sure that everybody has an equal chance to speak without some sort of interruption. Um, and um, and then people can invite, um, you know, invite that dialogue um, after the after each round. Um, so just just um, work that out yourselves. Um, if you find, um, let me see. I'm just making sure there's. Um, of people in each room and um, we've got about uh, so we're coming up to three let me just check my um, perfect okay we've got we're gonna allow for a good a good 25 minutes um, so plenty of time the questions are the first round, what have I learned from what I've heard so far from Anna and Elizabeth? What has really struck a chord? Maybe that's what what have, what is challenging. Um, and what does this mean for me in my life, in my work, in my sphere of influence? That's round one, what we learned, what we've heard. And then round two, what language or narratives could I use to help myself and my council or those in my in my world of work uh, connect soil health with with human health better. So I'm going to open the breakout rooms. Have great discussions. Jeremy, I'm going to move you to a different one. Maddie, thanks yeah. very much. Good to see you. Um, I haven't joined other groups because I've got to um, disappear now, but um, sorry for the general radio silence as well. well. We'll catch up soon. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah lovely to see you, Gavin. Are you yeah. well? Uh, I am well, yeah. I yeah, have a lot going on family bereavement and things like that so um uh, it's the silence but we'll um we'll catch up soon yeah well done for all you're doing yeah you too yeah, yeah. it'd be lovely to catch up yeah, yeah. take care yeah. Bye. Bye. um Holly and Connor, are you there and not able to join or are you just having a pause? I'm at the school gates here, Maddie. <laughs> so I, so I, I had this watch on my phone, if I can stand up. I'll be back in, in about 10 minutes, so I should get the second half of the breakout room. Okay, brilliant. brilliant. Thank you. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Hi, I've put you. I've realised that you're in a room that, for some reason, other people aren't in. That's okay. I was like, I'll give it a few minutes there. So then I was like, it's just me. Yeah, somewhere in cyberspace. I'm not quite sure where. <laughs> That's okay. Let me um, move you 
two and a go to room six. Thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> no problem, <laughs> sorry. There we go. So hopefully everyone's got a cup of tea and had a bit of a jump around and stretch. Um, in this last section of the ping today, we're gonna hear from um, Gavin and John and Kathy from a county council perspective um, on all of this. Um, Kathy and John have just joined. They've been at another food strategy and public health meeting, just come straight in from there. Um, so if you, um, Gavin, are you happy to go first? And do you want to um, screen? Oh, is it possible if I go first? I've got to leave at four. I don't know if Gavin's got to leave. Is he going to leave as well? That's fine. I've got to leave at half four, so on you go. Ah. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go All for right. it. And do you need to screen share, John? Um, yeah, we've got a few slides. I'm not used to Zoom, but I'll have a go. I think yeah, I'll, um, it should it should just let you easily. If you just introduce yourself and then yeah, we'll do, we've got yeah. um, 10 minutes and then we've got a bit of time for questions. Um, yeah. So as well. can you see that OK? Yeah, looks good. Yeah, cool. So um, from myself and um, Kathy, so hopefully it's Kathy's, Kathy's here as well. Um, and we both work in the public health division in Nottinghamshire County Council. So, yeah, we're just going to tell you, basically, we just want to tell you a little bit about our story over the last few years about how our sort of food related work has um, developed. And then um, may not be here for yours, Gavin, but I think really interesting to compare, because although Nottinghamshire and Leicestershire are obviously quite close to each other. We, we actually, during the pandemic, I think apart from probably a few emails, we've been heads down getting on with uh, work, haven't we? So well, that'll be interesting. So yeah, a little bit about Nottinghamshire for those that um, don't know, in the East Midlands, um, just under 800,000 population. Um, sort of, um, I think very similar on a lot of things to the England average, but like a lot of, um, areas we do have um, inequalities on on some things so for example in one of the public health areas that we look at obesity we do have um, sort of similar levels to England but interestingly in the south of the county in Rushcliffe which is a more affluent area we've got some of the lowest levels of childhood obesity in the country but then in some of our areas, which are sort of in the ex uh, mining type areas, we've got quite high levels. So we do have those sort of place based inequalities. And then I thought I'll try and put a food related statistic on there. So from our school meal service, um, they deliver, uh, you know, 35,000 um, school meals a day. So that's quite a big undertaking that the county council does. So um, we put a few slides together and we're probably going to focus quite a lot just on this side as a sort of aid, aid memoir, really. So food and nutrition in, in a lot of um, local authority public health teams has been a priority for many years, particularly driven by the increase in obesity over um, the last 20 years. And, and there's obviously a big recognition of um, diet related disease as well, and the importance of food and nutrition in that. And in, in Nottinghamshire, and this might, I haven't looked at the, Eng the England average, but um, obesity is now the, the biggest cause of um, disability life years. That's how long people live in disability. It's, it's sort of higher than smoking now. And other things related to diet, such as high blood pressure and that sort of thing, are actually in, in the 
some of the highest factors which contribute to people's ill health and the years people live with ill health. So food and nutrition has always been a public health issue, but you could argue it's even more of a public health issue than it, than it has been. So that really often drives the agenda for local authorities, I'd say. And um, like a lot of other areas, it, trying to improve the what we call the food environment um, has been one of our priorities since 2017 in, in our health and wellbeing strategy. So all upper tier local authorities, so that's like a city council, a county council, or a, um, a London borough or a metropolitan council have health and wellbeing boards and they have to produce a health and wellbeing strategy. So we're really pleased that um, we're able to get that as one of our strategic priorities. And what that means is then we're able to work in partnership with other councils. So in Nottinghamshire, for example, we've got seven district councils, NHS organisations, as well as the community and voluntary sector, etc., that we work with. So one of the things we did in 2018, we fund, we wanted to move a little bit away from just commissioning. We commission uh, sort of health promotion services, which help people um, eat more healthily and lose weight and that sort of thing. And we actually funded um, food initiatives in each of our seven districts. And then the other thing that we wanted to do, um, you'll be familiar that a lot of other um, local authorities up and down the country have either got a food strategy or developed a food charter. So in Nottinghamshire, we've developed a, wanted to develop a food charter, which sort of set out why food is really important to us. And within that, we didn't just want to look at the sort of food and nutrition aspect, we wanted to look at food systems. So we'll, we'll have the food, charter on the screen in a minute but really that looks at food in a more holistic sense and really thinks about food and communities and uh, food and the environment and the interrelation um, with, with climate change and other environmental indicators and then also food in the economy so what we're trying to do then is engage our wider local system in the work around food and not just it be a public health issue and then in 2019, we were lucky enough to be chosen as one of five local authorities in the government's Childhood Obesity Trailblazer programme. And the title might suggest that, oh, we're focusing on weight management or something or, you know, that sort of a programme. But what we actually wanted to do was test out different um, ways that we could influence the, the, the food environment for families in the early years. So again, we took a very sort of food system approach to that. And then obviously all, everything that I've just said has all been completely curtailed as everything in life by the COVID pandemic. So a lot of our developmental work sort of went on hold. But again, like most local authorities up and down the country working with partners, a big part of the COVID humanitarian response has been um, responding around food and food supply. And out of that, there's been a lot of work around um, food insecurity. So if Kathy's uh, available, I don't know, Kathy, if you want to come in and talk a little bit about the food insecurity work. Yeah, can do. Um, just put that on. Um, we've just come from a food insecurity network meeting. So I feel all buoyed up to be really enthusiastic about it. Um, as part of the, um, as John said, you know, part of the response to COVID, there was um, a joint approach to providing emergency food parcels. So a lot of that work was really focused on that immediacy um, of the food parcel delivery and getting food out to people. You know, and rightly so. There was very little um, focus on building resilience in communities and looking at a sustainable response around food and all that food entails. So community food growing and uh, social eating and, and, and all the and food banks and all the rest of it. So the Food Insecurity Network was born out of that need really. And um, so we set about sort of pulling the right sort of partners around the table and working in a way that it was completely across all the boundaries that are you know, local authority boundaries. So what we currently have is a city, county, community and voluntary sector, NHS, universities approach to 
looking at um, the whole food system through the food insecurity network. It's food insecurity, probably in just in name only, because we do look at that whole food system. Um, and we've got two main work streams to give us a real sort of focus down and action based uh, approach to it all to get something done, coin that phrase, um, was to look at community food growing as a priority and social eating as a priority because that re-emergence out of the pandemic, we saw that the additional benefits of people coming together around food and using food as an enabler for people to re-emerge out of the pandemic was a key kind of thing to work on. And so they're the two sort of current priorities. Um, I think what the Local Resilience Forum has done has really been able to see the FIN as a structure and a mechanism through which it could distribute some of the funding that was coming down through national um, from national government. So some of the contained funding was top sliced for food. Uh, God, all these all these food puns. Sorry, I do apologise. Um, so we there was an eight hundred thousand pounds fund that was allocated to for, to uh, the food insecurity network it wasn't allocated to the food insecurity network but the food insecurity network was used as a mechanism of assessment and allocation of that fund which it was testament to the value that that provided that the network provided to the county council um what else can I say? Oh, through this work, although it was started, it's been sort of uh, generated out of that COVID response, it's got legs on its own. It's, it's, it's really sort of building on the work around the food environment that John uh, just spoke about before, before the pandemic hit. So the pre, pre pandemic work. And what we've found now that it's opened up many doors around food to have conversations around linking up those additional, uh, the, the, the linked agendas around environment and economic development, as well as health and, and food being a big part of that. So food is an enabler to link all of those other agendas up for us in a, a local authority. Um, so we can build in that strategic approach um, and the triple win, I think it's called, isn't it, John? <laughs> Where you're actually using one thing to actually get the wins across all of those agendas. Um, and it was from that work stream around community growing that we had conversations around farm start and upscaling of community food growing. And now we're looking at taking that forward in, well, which John will talk about in a minute, around some of the, the steps forward and the next steps going forward with this. So. What we've what we found with the Food and Security Network, it's enabled that voice at ground level, uh, at that community and voluntary sector level, to to influence some of that policy going forward, um, which I think is a massively positive and um, refreshing and creative and agile way of working, which we're desperately trying to hang on to as a as a means of. Um, practice going forward for local authorities it's not always the easiest thing in the world to um, to do it that way but we, it works and uh, so I'll leave I'll stop there because I could talk about this forever but John can pick up where we're the next steps. Have we run out of time Maddie or are we over time? Probably massively. <laughs> um, uh, we we'll wrap up yeah. with the rest of that. Yeah, yeah we'll probably, thank you. Yeah so um, so basically, what all that that we've said has then enabled um, one of our lead councillors took forward a full council motion on food and nutrition, and that basically means that our our local authority has sort of said this is like a priority issue for all of our council, which is really really fantastic. And then we're also looking at things like can we link in food into our um, um, work the leveling up. Um, agenda, which the, we know the national food policy is mentioned in there, linking in with that concepts around devolution. And then uh, this, this is some nice pictures of some of our food clubs and community work. Um, um, yeah. And, and then this is our food charter that we mentioned. So be a bit hard to see on there. And we are developing a website for this. And I know Leicestershire, we're looking at Gavin's uh, Leicestershire website, which is great. 
um, is an example of good practice. But as I said, this is really about if you can read the bottom bit, it's um, having a vision for food, a vision statement around Nottinghamshire having healthy, wholesome, affordable and sustainable food. And that's on the menu for everybody. Um, and we're thinking of that through the lens of communities, um, food economy and the environment. And, and one of the things why we're here is because um, we've been talking to Jeremy and Maddie about the opportunity around a Farm Start initiative as part of this that we're, we're, we're looking into amongst um, a range of, of other things. So I did, I did join a bit of the breakout session. I was asked, you know, are our concepts around food, nature, linking in with nutrition, have we got a written policy on that? So I can't say we've got a written policy on that, but I think because it's mentioned, uh, it's only one sentence, but it says that encourage food growing that is good for biodiversity in our food charter. So I think just having that as a strategic statement, it might just seem a little thing, but having those words, that's enabled us to have a conversation with our conservation team. We manage a lot of land in Nottinghamshire who we've never really worked with. Um, so I think like Cathy was saying, it opens a lot of doors. So I think our learning is that um, the, the, dance, the positive side of the pandemic has really enabled us to build on opportunities and momentum. We're really and capturing this test and learn approach where we, we don't just commission a whole massive service. We, we start small, we test it out and we learn from that. And really the importance of um, developing and nurturing relationships. And I think the other thing from me attending our food insecurity network before this is, is this concept um, of just going where the energy is. You know, there's so much energy at the moment around food, food growing, social eating, um, food supply chain, <coughs> all that sort of food system stuff from the voluntary sector, public sector and universities and, and some private sector organisations. So for us as a local authority, it's it's really enabled us to broaden that that focus, as I say, not just look at food and nutrition in a very narrow sense. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John and Cathy. It's really inspiring to see and how the how the um, support from kind of top down, if you like, is just as important as from the bottom up in terms of levers and catalyzing things and going, you know, accelerating the work. Um, it seems like you've got kind of um, a, a, a good amount of space within which to kind of flex these ideas. Yeah which is hugely important because we're all doing this in many ways for the sort of the first time. It needs that spirit of kind of, yeah, testing and trying and collaborating. Um, does anyone have any immediate questions for John or Cathy before we move on to Gavin? Uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks, John and Cathy. And this may be one that, that might hold to after Gavin's spoken. Um, we're, we're all agreed that the pandemic has brought about a focus on food, both in terms of local authorities and uh, governments uh, to a degree. Uh, and, and with that has come huge tranches of funding or relatively huge tranches of funding. Um, I'd just be interested in, in views on whether as we come out of the pandemic and that funding stops um, or slows down, will, will the focus move away from food back onto something else, do you think? And I'm not saying, you know, be specific about your local authority. But, but do you think that that funding and support landscape will change, will, which means we, we lose, lose food from the agenda again? Um, yeah, I, th I, think, I think it's a big, it is a risk, uh, Chris. I, I completely agree because um, 
you know, the, the landscape's always changing, new priorities, new priorities, there's competing priorities all the time. So I think um, we're, we're completely aware of that, because as you say, in our area, and I'm sure up and down the country, so much funding's come in. And um, obviously as a local authority, there's been a lot of people working on trying to make sure that's used, because um, it's public money used used in a, in a very, um, the value for money aspect. But we're also, as part of that, really um, trying to make sure that the work is sustained because a lot of work is a lot, which is great. A lot of funding has been given out to community organisations, for example, in Nottinghamshire. But like you say, what happens when that money runs out? Or do they all just drop off? So well, that, that's why I think a network such as Cathy's described, the Food Insecurity Network, bringing people together and trying to learn from it but also trying to um, you know support support where possible um so and and then the, the more boring stuff about us then advocating for that and making it a a um a lo locally a, a strategic priority then in in a in a local strategy which is lasting for the next four years will then enable help enable this to be on the agenda so yeah, I agree with what you're saying. So that's why we're sort of doing those things, support, trying to support a network of organisations, help enable those groups to support each other and us being helping to be the glue for that. And then also um, getting that um, it is a strategic priority and getting some political leadership with a sort of small P because it's local politics, but it's important where we work and really, really bringing all that together. And I think for us, um, food, food, food systems, how you describe it, is at the moment one of our top priorities. And, and so part of our job is to keep advocating for that and keep it at the top of the list. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, John. Um, over to you, Gavin. Is a uh, is a uh, ten minutes okay? And do, John, do you have to go now? I do, but I think I believe Kathy's um, staying, so she, she might be around to answer any questions along with Gavin at the end. Great. Thanks very yeah. much. Thank, for your thank you. John. Thank you. Um, Brilliant. Can you see? Yeah. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. That's, re that's really interesting. Um, so uh, thanks, John and Cathy. That's, um, it's good to hear what you're up to. And um, interestingly, um, one of your numbers that you put up, 35,000 meals a day, um, is exactly the number that I give out for Leicestershire as well. So we, um, we, th there's a lot of similarity between, um, between our work in Leicestershire and, um, and your work in Nottinghamshire. And um, also a lot of similarities between um, the work that you've just described and our work. So I'm not going to really talk very much about um, the specifics of how we have got to where we've got to necessarily. Um, and some of, I, I posted a, um, a link to our web pages, which are still a bit basic, but the chart is up there and the food plan's up there. So do feel free to have a, a poke around and hopefully you'll see um, that work improve over the, the coming um, months as we as we get our communications act together a bit better. Um, so I work for public health, similar to, uh, to John and Cathy. Um, so I work in public health in Leicestershire County Council. Um, and, and we've been working towards um, sustainable food work for the past few years. Um, largely on the back of work that we started with um, Food for Life. So we've had a Food for Life Commission since um, 2013. Um, and, um, and that's a really long running um, um, aspect of, of our good food work. Um, and that's led us to um, looking at having a more um, food systems based approach across, um, across all of, all of um, our council's work. And so what I'm going to talk about is more um, sort of where that's landed well, where it hasn't landed well, um, what some of the what some of the learnings of, of um, um, I've found and, and how that might help other areas with um, how to interact with with local authorities on um, on good food work, 
um, and you know maybe some of, some of that might sort of chime. Um, so in our work is um, we have kind of two levels really. So it's all about partnership and it's all about engagement on both levels. Um, some of it is more strategic and then some of it is more practical. Um, and um, the, the strategic stuff um, is um, obviously quite internal to the council. Um, the practical stuff it crosses both internal and external, but we're, we're moving more towards using the practical work that is external to try and shape a lot of the strategic stuff that happens internally. Um, and so the, the sort of internal work, and actually I'll move on from this because um, our internal work um, is, um, is largely um, driven by our Leicestershire County Council steering group. So we have this, this kind of structure set up here now. Um, and we've, we've kind of landed on this over time. It's taken a while to develop an approach that we think kind of works in, in our particular um, area. So we have a management group, which, um, which kind of steers the core of, of, um, of the work. And my work is funded internally. So, you know, it's important that, um, that, that we, that we have a view on, on making sure that that money is, is used effectively. Um, so the management group looks after that sort of internal resource, but it does have external representation on, on that small group. Um, but the management group is then steered by an internal and an external steering group. So the internal steering group is made up of county council departments um, that, that cover most of the departments in the council. Um, and that really makes sure that we're, um, we're sharing different messages and projects across the different, um, the different departments, that we're uh, making sure that um, our school meal people are, are hearing about um, different areas env of environmental work that are going on and different projects that are developing. Um, and, and then making sure that um, when different departments have a particular food ask, they can feed that into the management group. And then the external steering group is, is becoming really important now. And, you know, I think it's always, I've always wanted to have a strong external voice, but it's been always been really hard to, to try and gather all of those voices together in a coherent way. It's now starting to become more coherent and we have partners like Food for Life and the Trussell Trust and the Allerton Project um, and starting to understand how UAC can, can get involved in that. But we also have um, a lot more of the sort of the grassroots, the smaller organisations, the food banks, the community pantries, um, the, um, the community gardens really starting to feed into that. And what we really want to see is that external steering group presenting challenges into the county council. Um, also looking at how we, can, how we can develop projects and understanding as a group. But you know, we, need to, we need to make sure that um, as a council, we're not just saying, oh, and we think this and we think that and we think the other. We need to, we need to be challenged by, by the partners that are engaging. So this is kind of the structure that hopefully enables all that to happen. Um, and, you know, it would be interesting to hear um, how others are interacting with, with their local authorities and whether they're seeing um, interesting routes into, into local authorities to, to sort of help um, understand how they can influence policy and influence projects that happen within, within councils. Um, I've put up a, a, just a bit of a... Um, a table of challenges and opportunities that I've seen as, as I've developed this work. And um, I think just before I sort of go into this, my, I do work within the local authority, but I'm not really from a local authority background. So I'm, I'm always um, trying to see it from external perspectives when, when, I'm, when I'm working on this work. Um, so challenges from developing the work in terms of within a council, within um, how, how to reflect this upon um, policy and how people might reflect to over um, in policy. Um, there's always silos um, and there's always different agendas. There's always different departments. Um, so there are challenges in, in how we um, 
how we look at sustainable food across those different silos. Um, there are challenges in terms of um, um, subject and scale. So when, um, when I'm trying to develop a, pro a particular project, um, how that scales up is, is a really interesting challenge. Um, and when we talk about, for example, school food procurement, um, there is, um, there's, there's, there's an interesting um, problem when we try and turn something from a pilot into, into something that might happen at scale. Um, education and politics are probably linked, um, but in terms of um, a whole food system approach, um, I think that there's, there's always an issue with um, how we help people to understand um, what we're talking about when we talk about food and food systems. Um, and, um, and how we then turn that into policy. Um, external representation I've, I've already mentioned in terms of you know, trying to facilitate um, partners' views and present partners' challenges. Um, and in particular, I think procurement is, is a really interesting challenge. Um, and it's something that people are talking a lot about at the moment with dynamic purchasing. And it's something that we are looking at, but um, you know, there, there are, it does present challenges in terms of cost um, and ease of procurement. Alongside that, there's a whole, there's a whole load of opportunities that, that start to present themselves when we start looking at food within, within local authorities and within, um, within policy. Um, ownership of, of the agenda, I think, presents a really interesting opportunity as people start to, and, and as departments start to develop projects, um, they do see the opportunities that, that can exist. And so you do end up getting some of that ownership. Um, the whole systems approach, um, whilst it is a challenge, it, is, it really is starting to present an opportunity. And I think some of those opportunities are coming out of um, the, the COVID pandemic, as, um, as John and Cathy um, talked about. Um, there are some interesting opportunities coming forward with, with councils and with politics. And with, with the sort of the political um, leadership, um, I'm seeing that within Leicestershire that, that they are starting to ask some interesting questions about um, the carbon footprint of the food that we buy, the health implications of the food that we buy, um, more plant-based diets is starting to come up. And it's a marked change um, literally over, over two years. Um, two years ago, um, the councillors all um, voted through um, that um, chips would be on the menu every day of the week in the in the council canteen and now they're starting to challenge the, the health of the food that we put on the plates of in our canteen so you know there are there are some big changes that have happened um, um, I've talked about procurement um, and um, position. I can't remember why I put that on there, so I'll, I'll kind of gloss over that. Um, some examples of um, areas where um, we've started to see um, sustainable food starting to come through um, a lot more now. Um, obviously, there is that um, public health have paid for my position. They have paid for other positions on the back of um, the, the COVID pandemic. Um, that there is an increasing commitment um, in terms of um, providing that resource to start looking at, um, at food systems approaches. Um, and there's a long-term commitment to Food for Life, which has driven so much of this work. And there's a, um, there's a new impact report that uh, Leicestershire Food for Life have put together, which um, if, I, if I'm allowed to, I will sh I'll share. I'm, I'm hoping it will be made public very soon. Um, but there's some really great um, statistics and numbers and demonstration of the impact of that long term commitment. Um, and that has been um, paid for through public health, um, has been supported through um, through local authority activity. So, you know, it's, it's a really great example. Um, we're now seeing a holiday activity and food programme being rolled out nationally um, and um, being able to have a three-year committed um, funding um, looking at how we um, support um, children in receipt of, um, 
um, of uh, free school meals with their holiday food and activity um, provision is, um, is a great thing and, and offers up an opportunity to, um, to, to project a, a, an improving food um, food offer within that holiday activity and food program, I think. So, you know, there's something that, that people could engage with there, I think. Um, in Leicestershire, we've got a new healthy weight strategy, which is a, um, a systems-based approach. So very much builds on um, a whole um, a whole food systems um, approach and, and looks at how, um, you know, how do we tackle a food environment? How do we look at um, training and, um, and frontline um, staff and all of those sorts of elements of, um, um, of, of healthy weight. So it's, it's really starting to look beyond just the provision of, of central services. And then finally, there's, there's um, increasing commitments um, which can be built upon. So uh, Leicestershire County Council is a signatory to Court Hall 2030, which looks at um, a 50% reduction in the carbon emissions associated with uh, the food system. Um, and it, it includes food waste. Um, so there's, there's a whole load of, um, of interesting elements that will start coming out of things like Court Hall, uh, the Glasgow Declaration, a number of things that local authorities are starting to commit to. So that's certainly worth um, sort of link, uh, leaning on. Um, finally, I just wanted to give a small example of a, of a small project that we have, we're just embarking on, um, which might start to bring um, some other discussions pertinent to UAC um, and other aspects like uh, Farm Start. So we're, we're just starting to look at carbon and environmental footprint of food that we purchase within our school meals um, service. And we're trying to look at um, if we change procurement, so instead of buying from, we do have gold food for life served here for our school food, but we still buy through large, um, through large people like ESPO. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm wanting to look at is if we bought through local small um, uh, grass fed um, 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 cattle farmers locally, what would be the carbon and biodiversity benefits of doing that? And so I'm, I'm really trying to look at how, um, how we might put different metrics on the food that we buy through school meals um, so that we can look at um, if we were less bothered about cost and more bothered about the carbon and environmental commitments that we've made as a local authority, how far could we push that? And, and what would that mean for costs? What would that mean for the, um, the, the way that we buy our food? Um, so, so that's that project, it, it's not properly started yet, but we, we're just, we've, um, we've put, a, um, we're just um, seeking consultants to help us with that. We've got two farmers who are, who are willing to, to engage. One of them is Grace, is a bachelor father, um, and we're just starting to, to look at that. So that, that could be quite an interesting piece of work as well. And obviously we'll feed into some of these conversations about local farming, um, land provision, all of those sorts of aspects. So I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry, it was a bit rambly. Mm -hmm. um, I'll stop sharing. It's fantastic. Thank you very much, Gavin. That's brilliant. Um, I'm going to put um, a, a link to a Mentimeter in the chat. So <clears throat> we've heard a lot of really interesting stuff and a lot of perspectives and we've had discussions and um, shared some ideas and perspectives and probably have thought of a lot of things that we can, ways that this work can weave together. Um, and I just want to capture this in the last, in the last 10 minutes um, and I, so I'm going to put in the chat a link for Mentimeter. So if you click on the link, and you might need the voting code, I'm not sure. Um, there should be a question that comes up, which, tell me if it doesn't work. <clears throat> um, are you able to open it? Is it open in, a, in another? 
Uh, okay, brilliant. Cool. Lovely. So um, what would be great is if you, all of you could just um, type in and you can, you can add as many different responses as you would like. And what we're really thinking about is how do we push this forward from where we are um, based on the, what we've heard? Are there ways that we can accelerate and amplify this, this kind of connection between soil health and human health even further um, from where we are, from wherever we, our starting point is right now? Um, So do start um, typing in, and I think that I can, um, is it letting you type things in? Yeah, great, okay. And I think if I press, yeah, there we go. So, yeah, what would you put in an, in a in your kind of dream policy or framing or narrative um, that could, would take this work to the next level? So, if you're talking to people in your sphere of influence, how would you might you start to talk about it differently? Um, Maybe there are other people that you're, you would want to talk with more. Maybe you'd want to talk with more producers. Um, or where are the, the kind of gaps in the conversation? Who, who do we need to reach out to and how? And don't worry about writing it in a particular way or anything, just a brain dump. And we'll share this around so that we want it to be a useful resource um, for people who are working in this space and other local authorities and elsewhere. So referencing the right to nutritious food. Nutritious food as a right. Investment in local skills, local jobs and local produce improves the quality and availability of locally grown nutrient dense food. Highlight food's role as an enabler to link all different departments. That's true, food has a way of bringing people together. Yes, a right to nutritious food. We need to be clearer and better with definitions and clarity about around value. To begin with, many people cannot afford food. It's not that they're not eating nutrient-dense food, they're not eating any kind of five a day, regularly skipping meals, give people enough money to buy sufficient food. I think one really interesting thing for me was how by farming agroecologically, we can optimize the way that we use land, so that we're planting one carrot instead of 200. 
or 20 even to get the same amount of nutrition. And that's a huge game changer in terms of how we optimize our land use close to where we live. Um, and Vicky shared earlier a link to the fringe farming project as well, which is looking at doing all this in the peri-urban spaces. Schemes that link emergency food providers with local farms for direct sales. Brilliant. There's a lot of research already about what works. Yes. So we're coming into our last few minutes. It's been a really fascinating session. Um, I'd just really appreciate, I'm gonna stop sharing, keep typing if this stuff comes up. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing that screen. And I'd love to just um, do a very quick go round for people just to say anything that they want to by way of leaving this session. How, how, am, I, how am I leaving? Um, what am I taking with me? Just something very brief, like a, just a 30 seconds, just a nugget, what's, what's um, stood out for you. Um, Robin, <laughs> can I pick on you to, to begin with if you're there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, and we had a really good discussion in the subgroup um, about who we're talking to. And we talk about density of food as opposed to food vegetables generally. And I think for me, uh, although this stuff's valuable, we have to think at a very simple level, as was reflecting quite a lot of those comments about who we're, who we're talking to, who the audience is, um, who's going to listen to different arguments. Some arguments work for some people, but but often a lot of this stuff will go over people's heads. So that was a, a takeaway. Thank you. Um, Sue. Sorry, just as on uh, on mute and hiding. Um, what have I taken away from it? I th I think I would I would echo what Robin just said. I mean, for me we're very practical and focused on how do you deliver this and I think there's a big gap really between the discussions going on to create the policies and how you actually implement that at the level of production and ultimately you know for the consumer to be able to make the choices that um, we would all like consumers to make so I, I think I think there's a there's a gap there at the moment and and it's a challenge for all of us I think to translate that because this bubble that we all live in, you know, we're learning an awful lot, um, you know, within the bubble about these issues. But when you try to take that outside our, our bubble um, and, you know, discuss it with other people who are not in this, in this field, um, it, you can see it's quite difficult to, to grasp these concepts. And when people are really concentrating on you know how am I going to be able to afford to pay my electricity bill this month they're just not in a in the space to be able to think about food in this sort of technical way so I, that's I think we have to translate it we have to find a way to translate it in in both how we communicate it but if you're looking at production in really thinking about how can we get more people on the land producing food in this way and making it easy for them you know how do they get access to the land and how do they get started you know can policy makers look at providing grants for example to help people actually take that first step um, and and then translating it as I say into into the communications piece afterwards but useful really useful to to think all this through gives us another 10,000 things to add to the list Thank you, Sue. Jack. 
Hiya. Yeah. Um, I would just like to second everything Sue just said, actually, just as to conclude. It's been really amazing, all the information we're talking about, but um, the gap between that and making actionable change within our communities within different contexts, I think, is a really important point of focus in order for us to sort of move forward uh, within our communities. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for the time today and all the stuff you've brought to the table. Yeah, it's been really good. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Connor? Yeah. Um, yeah, great to hear from everybody. And uh, for me, I think it's, yeah, it's, we, we're uh, in our city council area, we're at the point of getting it out to the public now um, through our Sustainable Food Places programme. We're having a front facing meeting tomorrow. 150 people and uh, so the policy makers and uh, the strategic partners are going to be talking to the people who are consuming and uh, you know purchasing the food getting it out in small business owners i just think uh, it, it, it's that point of getting everybody believing the same thing and moving forward that we can grow really good value nutritious food together that we you know that, that we can get out of the giant food system and we can create small local food systems that, that do have a better return we, we can't use the false economics of the 49p carrots because you know and with the figures that elizabeth's talking about there that shows that there's no point in trying to trying to argue on false premises and false grounds we, you know where you can get children working with the value of you know the taste that they get you see that they'll eat food that they wouldn't touch if it came wrapped in plastic from a supermarket you know they'll, they'll eat raw purple sprout and broccoli and go mad for you know the, the, the fresh corn from the ground they can tell that there's there's a difference on there we're getting the tools to prove that and we can get out to people that we don't have money anymore or we're going to have very little money so it's really about uh you know building that that, that, that local economy for that, that that allows people to to, to taste the, the fruits of it and, and get it out to, to every aspect of it get it out of the ghetto as such but make it something that normal people do and that that is just accepted that it's it's, it's not a, a happy thing and it's not a food policy thing it's just it's just a normal thing to do again to grow at every level mm, amazing thank you Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Gavin. You've got to shoot off. I'm sorry, we're, we're uh, it's at 4.30, running a little bit over. Um, so just, it'd be lovely to hear. Does anyone else have to leave right now as well? I just got, it'd be lovely to hear a little bit of others' feedback. Um, Jade, do you want to share your thoughts, parting thoughts? You're muted. Thanks, everyone. Really interesting, especially to listen. So exciting, listening. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Jack and Elizabeth and Holly as well that there's a gap um, between the kinds of things we're saying here and what will happen when I go to the food hub later on this evening to um, work with people who are struggling to pay for food at all. Um, and it's one of many gaps in people talking about good food. Um, so to make this practical, I think what we need to be doing is spending time with conventional farmers and spending time in food banks and spending time um, in the networks we don't normally mix in and really understanding what's happening for people in, the, in other situations to our own so that we can start to make some more practical suggestions. We can't just tell people to stop ploughing. They can't just tell people to have their full custard creams that they need to be buying organic food, let alone nutrient dense food. They're not eating any five a day. They can't pay for it. And they can't even, you know, they can't afford the bus fare to go to the shop, let alone carry it back. So I think that's that's my comment really is to, to go and spend time with um, other people and understand their situations. Listen first because of those gaps that you've talked about. Great, thank you. Um, Felicity? 
hello I was just busy typing it actually for a minute ago but <laughs> um I think the, the I think the main takeaway that I have as somebody who works on soil quality soil health is that we really need the evidence base there we talk about nutrient dense food and we talk about um you know uh in industrial or, uh, or commercialized agriculture being less um less nutrients uh, rich but there there is still question marks over why that is the case is it because of the the fact that we're pushing towards um just growing more crops in a similar area are we taking the nutrients out of the soil or is it because we are using the wrong varieties and if you think about if you're taking the same variety and growing it uh, locally in, in urban areas, will you get any more dense food if it's the variety in comparison to, to the management? And so thinking about that is is really key issue when we're when we're talking about the methods. Um, and obviously close to my heart and research time. <laughs> and then the other bit is actually getting people to, you know, we talk about having access to food. But we need to be more in tune with the with the gardening year uh, and and what food will be available when if we're going to promote sort of growing your own and growing and using those options it's you know you can't you're going to have different different food available at different times brilliant thank you very much um holly Yeah, um, interesting discussion. I'm sorry I missed some of it in the middle. Um, some uh, problems, and um, I second. I think Sue summed it up really well, actually. Um, so, just what does it practic practically take? And I think that's both from the facilitating the um, more growing. Um, and food production and the receiving so, um, side of things. But yeah, thanks everyone. I am going to need to head. Brilliant. Thanks, Holly. Um, Anna, Clayton. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I was late. And so I go away looking forward to catch up on the presentations. And I, at the moment, we're reviewing our theory of change around pathways to engagement in the work we do here in North Lancashire. And I've gone away with something that Anna said around the promotion focus and the prevention focus and just looking at that again through those eyes and making sure we're doing both. So that's really practically very helpful. <laughs> but I, I need to catch up on the presentation. Great. Lovely. Um, Chris. Um, where do I start? Uh, um, <laughs> a really, really good session uh, and, and lots of, uh, I think, as somebody put in the chat, food for thought there. Um, silos, um, different hooks for different people. Uh, where do we find the underlying hook that will um, attract policymakers in those really gritty urban areas, as well as those um, more rural local authorities, shall I say. So how do I, for example, how do I translate the Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire conversations with inner city Birmingham um, or, or, or the West Midlands? Um, and I agree with all the thing about space and, 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 you know, people don't have enough money to feed themselves or heat themselves, let alone think about um, whether the carrots organic nutrient dense or, or a 49p carrot, Connor, thank you. Um, but the thing that I guess jumps out to me, and this is really about growing as much as anything else, but a good friend of mine, Mike Hardman, who's uh, now at Salford Uni, wrote a review when he was doing his PhD about 10 years ago. And this, this review was about the rise of the food charter and will the rise of the food charter lead to a, a more proliferate urban growing system or peri-urban growing system? Will it lead to 
more engagement with with food in the city through growing. Um, and I might use Birmingham as as an example of that. Um, and this was ten years ago, and I I, I reread this three page review probably every month. Um, and I would just ask us how far have we actually moved forward from that review 10 years ago? We've got sustainable food places, which is doing a lot more for a lot more cities um, and, and, and certainly bringing food up the agenda for policy. But, but, but for Jimmy on the street, um, how do we engage better and move forward better from a place where as I say, I'm not, I'm not that convinced we've moved for mass, moved forward massively in the last ten years, and I'm happy to send you the reference to that review, uh, Maddie, so you can include it in the notes. But I can't find it at the moment, which is why I've been bending up and down off screen to try and find it. <laughs> Great, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, um, Elizabeth, and then Anna, just to conclude your reflections on the session yeah it's no cool. yeah, i mean it's been um very interesting i think um i mentioned this in the breakout group so and there does seem to a few people have been picking up on this idea of the right to nutritious food so i suppose my thinking is around you know if we um want to almost like take up that right to nutritious food then the production, the continuing production of unhealthy food, which is also um, not optimizing soil health and ecosystem health, then there's something unjust about that. So I think it's just people to start, yeah, embracing the notion of we don't have to just accept <laughs> poor quality food let's have an aspiration of high quality food and then work backwards as to how we change our production systems to enable that and in doing so we will have these multiple benefits of greater carbon sequestration greater biodiversity and um, better soil structure and we're actually growing nutrient-dense food so it's a you know so win, win, win. But thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of talking today. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That's fantastic. And Anna, over to you. Likewise, thank you so much for participating in today's discussion. It's been very, very rich. Um, I'm reminded that to the scale <laughs> of the challenges that we're facing and also reassured that there is such a wide range of um people working in all these different spaces so that <laughs> i know that i don't have to think about everything i know we were we're a whole network of people working on so many different parts of the system and that's definitely reassuring so it gives me hope mm -hmm. um i'm also very encouraged by seeing the shift in narrative uh towards whole systems towards community engagement towards food as an enabler um for social change and um and to Chris's point, like, is, is a food charter really going to lead to change? Um, I, th I don't think on its own necessarily. So you can do a nice charter and, and if there's no action behind it, then obviously not. But the, there is an opportunity at the moment that people are <laughs> facing a crisis, but also very fed up um, with, with the situation. And, and hopefully there's enough of that without it being too overwhelming that it leads to action. And something that I always come out of these meetings just engaging more and more with is that local <laughs> adaptation is key so talking like sharing ideas nationally and through networks is so important but ultimately we can't avoid having to really get to know the local place that we're working with and the people that we're working with um, and starting from that local place is key for things to work out in practice um, so yeah thank you all so much for your insights and contributions has been very enriching. Brilliant, wonderful. Jeremy, have you got any any closing words before I 
yeah, unfortunately, I, my internet dropped out for about 10 minutes. I missed the, the, missed the conclusion of the Mentimeter thing. Uh, hopefully that's been recorded on yours, Maddie. Yeah, um, yeah great. Uh, thanks, Anna. Thanks, Elizabeth. And the others have left, obviously. Um, it's very interesting running these meetings because at one point we had about 30 people and now we've got nine, <laughs> which is not surprising, really. But it wasn't the same 30 people all the way through the meeting. It was all <laughs> people coming and going. But that's great. I mean, it's really good if people feel they can pop in. Um, I'm, I'm just think this this is really interesting hearing from the county councils about their shift of emphasis and okay it may be a small start but the shift of an emphasis towards actually talking about that whole food system thing and actually cross departmental working and then Gavin talking about bringing in external stakeholders to actually challenge the council and I think that's where we sit and I think that's just a really interesting place and I said in the breakout room, um, I never thought I'd be sitting in meetings where we were talking about the semantics and the narrative, but that's again what we're doing. And it's actually really empowering. I think it's really, really interesting. Maddie and I will try and unpack all this in the next, whenever it is, we're going to, Friday, I think we're going to meet and we'll send around some further notes and we'll cut whatever recordings we've managed to make, we'll put on our YouTube channel. Uh, but it, but I think this is a it's a cumulative process, uh, incremental process, whereby each time we have a meeting, we get a bit more f f food for thought ha -ha, about how we're going to approach the next meeting. And that's empowering for all of us. And hopefully in the, in the end, it will be it will have some impact on that policy dialogue. Thanks, Maddie, as always, for your marvellous curation. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm sorry that we've gone over by 15 minutes. So I'm really, it's really lovely that you stayed um, till the end just to hear from from everybody. And, and yeah, it's hard to get those proportions right of, you know, small groups, presentations, capturing feedback, um, hearing each everybody's voices. And so that's a kind of work in progress with the pings to make sure that I, we we get the optimum format at some point um so yeah it's been it's been really fascinating and and our our next our next one's going to be all around the planning system um and that's when end of april 27th of april i just was lip reading you there 27th of april um with simon rustin who's the planner that works with uh, with us with, at the Urban Agriculture Consortium and have started, uh, Simon started connecting with Anna in Lancaster and, and others of the cities and places that we work with. And it's going to be fascinating because again it comes back as it always does to land and questions of land justice, land access, land affordability um, and, and so that discussion on the planning system will be really timely and we've got um senior planner of leeds city council also um speaking at that um so we'll send out more info on due course um but yeah i'll share i'll share the recordings and everything and um thank you so much maybe if you if you could can i share your um your film separately, Elizabeth. And if you have, do you have slides that you could share separately, Anna? Um, perhaps just send me that through. Um, great. So thank you all very much and have a lovely rest of your week. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Yourselves. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Thanks, Elizabeth.